Uh, I'm Tom Leonard, and I'm here uh, at the uh, Collaborative Arts uh, Museum here at uh, Cliffside in Hinckley, Ohio. And I'm joined here by John Smoko from Kent, Ohio, uh, Carol Klingel uh, from Lodi, Ohio, uh, Kathy Wellner, who is from Richfield, and uh, our invited guest today, uh, Al Bright from Youngstown. The first artist to show uh, one of his one of his paintings is John Smoko, and if John will come up and talk about his work and and give us a little insight, and then maybe we'll give him a little feedback. Okay, John, you're on. This is an early piece of mine titled "Mike, Second Year Senior," and I was just getting into cross hatching at the time, of inventing this style of colored pencil that I uh, that I've grown in, into. I had a lot of fun doing it as far as uh, working out the composition and uh, trying to get things just right, where to crop, where to have things going off. He had these big, massive arms, too. And uh, by the way, Mike's going to be in a parking lot if anybody says anything negative about this picture. <laughs> and, um, but he's, uh, again, one of my early pieces, but I think one of my successful pieces also. This piece is really strong. I, I, have, I love this piece. And I, the simplicity of it, the single solitary uh, figure, the placement, um, the way his face is just is bottom lit, it gives it, you know, it's just really dramatic. Um, the, uh, the strong highlights kind of just show that the character of this boy, I, I love his, uh, the, the strength of his arms, you know, that's the, um, the way he's standing, you know, sort of closed off, like defiant, you know, I, I dare you to say something about me. He really says, your, your picture really captures a lot of um, teenage angst and, and that, that particular um, kid. I, I know him by looking at that picture. He's defiant, you know, and just the way he sticks his chin out a little bit, and uh, that power and defiance comes right across. I love the, sh the lights and shadows on the face. I can almost see the acne coming through in some of these places. <laughs> through um, the whiskers. Pardon? Through the whiskers. Through the whiskers, yeah. I mean, you see yeah. that adolescent. Um, so it is a, a powerful piece. I don't even know what I would suggest to improve on this. What he's doing with composition is remarkable. Uh, first of all, the, the composition started with, uh, with his setting up a lighting system. He's dealing strictly with the golden mean. Uh, the slant of the shoulder sweeps you down uh, over his right arm, across his folded uh, arms, up the, uh, the left shoulder, right back up into the, the head, which is foreshortened in the composition those massive foreshortened arms, you know, pop out of the composition right on the golden mean, boxing the, uh, the square of the composition in his upper torso and his uh, head, which is submerging back into the composition. I think even the way the head is tipped to one side just so it takes the stiffness out of the whole Absolutely. portrait. He's a little vulnerable, and any time, you know, you tilt your head just a little bit, it, it just just adds that just little bit of vulnerability that, that, that he knows he has. And I think that his, the cross hats of hatching technique that John uses really kind of adds to the, 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 I don't know, roughness or texture of that character. That adds to, you know, if it were really, really smooth and sleek, your style, it, it just, it wouldn't fit that that portrait. I think it's a wonderful painting. He did a brilliant job with it. Um, he's a powerful presence about this young man. And the way you handle the folds in his clothes and, uh, and the attitude that, that's so quickly conveyed just by looking at it, uh, his expression and his, uh, that arrogant look that he has. But, uh, but you captured a sensitivity about him that, uh, that is immediate, and uh, it's the first thing that I, that I see. And I feel that this is partly you, even though it's not of you. 
It's uh, your interpretation of this young man. You can read this picture on so many different levels. I mean, you know, the, the, the visual of the, the boy, the, the texture, and the composition that Al was addressing. The composition is just exquisite. And the color, the way you have moved the color around, um, you know, the little spots of blue on his cheek and his, his chin and, and his arms. Mm -hmm. the, the way that that color just moves across the surface is, um, it's just, it's wonderful. This is how John wanted us to see. So he's placing uh, the energy force not in the, force, the, the formal things of foreshortening because that's actually the weaker part of the composition because uh, Cezanne uh, taught us uh, modulation and realization. And the fact of modulation and realization would have brought more texture and uh, energy to the foreshortened arms which are in the frontal plane of the composition. He, tr he moves the spectator beyond that formal into the head of the figure because the head is the center of the mind and the energy is happening there. John has raised the level of drawing with a drawing. colored pencil to beyond what you expect. It looks like a painting from it back does. here, but the way he builds up the textures of color, uh, layer upon layer, gives you that richness. Right. Okay, my next piece is titled uh, Kandahar, um, Homage to Picasso. And uh, I just finished this, and I've been doing a series of uh, drawings on, um, on war and uh, stuff in Af it happened in Afghanistan and the Mideast, uh, using dolls and, uh, as symbols. You know, I was inspired by Picasso's Guernica and his symbols in Guernica as a stallion and the bull and the light. Uh, this is the first drawing, by the way, that I've actually used black in for about 20 years. I sort of stayed away from black. The darkest color I'd get would be this uh, uh, ultramarine blue. And for this one, I decided to get into it with uh, black. And it's not just colored pencil. I ended up, uh, because of the layers I was putting on, I did end up having to do some oil pastel over top of that. So there's three or four different colors of oil pastel, plus with the black worked over top of the other colors. I would only make one suggestion about uh, the piece that I might add to it. I think that maybe if some cast shadows, I think cast shadows crawling across some of the figure forms like in the, in the front and in through some of them would add it a, oh, I don't know, sort of a spooky quality to it that would add to what he's trying to do. It would add some dimension too. It would some add, that are going back and some that are coming forward. <laughs> I'd like to disagree with, uh, with that concept. He is dealing with a configuration that is creating, again, the golden mean spiral. You cannot escape the composition first. As to what you go into beyond the composition is the content, which you have the liberty of reading once you get into it, but you cannot escape this piece. If you were 30 feet walking into a museum, you would see this spiral uh, and the way he positions that, I mean, that dark central form juxtaposed right in the center of four squares. He, he actually dice, you know, composed this thing in four squares. There's an upper right-hand corner, left-hand corner in his mind, and this thing is composed. And all of the figures, like uh, even in Cezanne's uh, contour of his forms, contour of his trees, that once you try to get out of the composition, you find a figure like this leaning figure up in the, uh, say, this upper four, fourth corner, draws you right back into the composition and sweeps you over to the next square and this large configuration uh, in the bottom continues to sweep you through. And he has hidden layers of linear structures in the work, much the same as we saw in his formal portrait. 
subtle red line that's running right through uh, the uh, the central area of the composition creates the uh, the matrix of the squares in the composition. The horse's head. Um, all these other things look broken and destroyed and so forth and that throwaway look. But the horse's head looks like a ceramic horse that you picked up um, at a fair or something, you know. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether that particular, this is a small thing, but I don't know whether that is really helping the rest of the composition. Um, I don't know what you've done with a horse's head, maybe broke it or uh, something, but it just looks a little too cutesy for the rest of the piece. Well, I'm reading, I'm reading this as a still life. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, I'm reading it as a still life, and it suggests, it suggests things in the still life. He's superseding it, but that is a monumental still life. That horse could yeah. symbolize the thing that prevails. I mean, you have, you know, you have all this Everything destruction, you have all of this brokenness, but there's something that always prevails. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't read that as cutesy at all. No. I read it as a strong part of all of this chaos. There's some, some piece that's intact. But he mentioned Guernica, and he's placing these things in here and using that horse. If you look at Picasso's Guernica, that horse just, it's war, you know, and screaming, and, uh, screaming at you. Uh, maybe I want to see a little more of that. Thank you, John. Okay, we, uh, now we we're going to turn our attention to Carol, who is going to show you us, us her work and tell us a little bit about it. Okay, this is a painting uh, that I did um, at my friend Joan's farm. It's an old farm. It's an old, uh, really, really old buildings and lots of things. I love light and shadow and the way light and shadow play across surfaces, especially uh, surfaces that aren't pristine and that aren't new. Nature kind of taking over something that's decaying. I like the, the, the uh, contrast between growing and living and decay and, and how those two come together. I feel like walking around the house to see what's inside those bushes and um, it, uh, it's a very common scene very captivating and you, you captured it so well that uh, it's very inviting. You have again used the golden mean so beautifully in, in the piece. If you put your hand up, squint and look at the square in the composition on the on what I'm looking at is my left hand side you see an explosion of light in that whole square. If you reverse your hand and blank out that square and look at the rectangle on the opposite side, on the right hand side, is a blend of shadows. At the square inside of that rectangle is a, a harmony of chiaroscuro lights and darks happening up in that upper square. And then if you box off the square at the very bottom of the composition on the lower right, it's all dense and dark. So th this is a symphony of chiaroscuro as she's playing, you know, she beautifully is. boxing this thing into a, a wonderful composition. My only, my own, my only uh, uh, suggestion uh, would be to add one more dimension to the composition, which would probably uh, uh, speak to uh, uh, your concept of uh, things aging and, and so forth, is to highlight more in your textures so that you bring out, uh, you know, the age of that fence laying against that blooming tree mm -hmm. or the texture in the tree against the crackling of the paint or pigment on the surface of that and emphasize, you know, textural rhythms through the composition. We have these two young trees growing up on the left hand side. I suppose they could have been painted all white and your eye would have you know, just gone up and down, but somehow you chose wisely in making dead um, 
tree elements or bark or whatever it is, and they sort of spread out in, in the rest of the picture and work with the shadows behind it. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, uh, I'm entranced by that area way over in the right where you can see way back, you know, and those trees back there. So you're setting up a contrast of what is happening in the foreground and, and those things that are happening back. I really like your sense of what's between things. You know, I look at the dark branches on the right, and you see the spaces between going back. Uh, even the trees on the left-hand side, you know, the spaces between there and the beautiful range of tones you have is, uh, for the shadows. I, I just love the way you treat shadows. You know, it doesn't look like you have really any gray in there. It looks like soft blues and soft greens and soft violets, and yet they come off of this beautiful gray on the building. I look at the left-hand side where you have the corner of the building where you have the plane coming this way and the other plane going back. Uh, the white and white are pretty close to each other, and I don't get that sense of that wall going back. The light is coming in really kind of up, up high and from this corner, and uh, that's why the shadows are dragged. They have that dragged look of how the sun would have dragged the shadow. And, and it takes me around the corner. I, I, and I feel comfortable with that. We read from left to right in the Western world, so we come into the composition with this tall wedge of, which suggested a defense, and it, diminish, it diminishes to a uh, uh, perspective point in the horizon. So you, it leads your eye really back into the composition beautifully there. I'll mention a teeny tiny thing that maybe bothers me uh, just a smidgen. The white area, about two thirds of the way up on the left, uh, yeah. yeah. To me, it, it is all flattened out as if there's nothing there. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be nice to have either a suggestion or a play of uh, detailed shadows in between the boards, you know, a recessed shadow, not a bunch of vertical parallel lines, but something that set up a nice pattern. And maybe some of those recessed shadows going up into the cast shadow underneath the eave. That tree in the background, uh, the little white tree, uh, is ending about the same place the side of your building ends. And I somehow see a shaft there, almost looking like a, a big tree. As an axiom, you don't see a hard line on both sides of a right. shape. Right. And when you put a hard, defined line on the, both sides of the shape, you create a flat shape. And that hard line of the light on one side of the tree and that hard... I'm talking about... Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then the plum vertical line of that other shape. Nothing it in just nature. Looks, it, look, it looks like a, a, like a wide tree to me. From here, it looks like it ends where the grasses end. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, and I was, what I would have suggested would be to put some of the bushes in front of the lower part of that tree, but not that the tree ended there, it ends up where the grass is. Yes. Uh, and uh, just to get rid of that, sh that shaft of darkness, which almost looked like a tree to me. Mm -hmm. But that's a very minor thing. So on this one, I decided to sort of zero in on just the, the shadows that were being cast on the surface um, with, a, you know, enough of the um, things around it to, to give it, the, again, that sense of place where it is. But I kind of zeroed in on the shadows rather than what it was being, what the shadows are being cast on. I'm not sure if making it smaller worked or if I should have expanded it to the same size as the other one but just did more of a zeroing in. I think your choice of, of size relationship and then really even that window on the left sort of is, is a repetition of the size of the painting itself. Mm -hmm. uh, the shadows are explosive and uh, exciting. I, I might have I might have put a few more hard edges in, I don't know. Uh, it may be that they're too soft edge all over, that maybe some uh, 
hard edges would help a little bit. It works as an abstract, it works as a, a realistic piece. Would you indulge me by turning it upside down? Uh -huh. This was, th this was sort of that a... That makes, you know, that's it. That works, obviously for me, more uh, as, you know, as a composition and as a representational piece as well because it is what we would see in nature. Uh, you know, the modulation, uh, foreground, middle ground, background, and, the, and it works better. It's awkward upside down because you see the, the rectangle and the square at the bottom falls out and you don't, you know, it, it doesn't uh, create the golden section. Hmm. I don't know, I kind of disagree with that in a way. I, I kind of like the, the original placement of it. It is um, taking chances. It's different. The other way it sort of sets itself on a plane is substantial, but, but this sort of I don't know, it explodes at the bottom and it hits the top. And it, it, it's a little different composition. I even like the, the leaves that are hanging down. I wish this was the comment I was making, that maybe the repetition of those hard edges of those leaves should be repeated into the shadows itself. Well, there I was trying to set up a little bit of depth mm -hmm. and in contrast between the sharpness of this coming into focus and, you know, the, the, you know, the thirds kind of thing, the, the composition, sort of formal composition that I was going for. One thing I, you know, I, I, that makes it a little stiff for me is that I can tell the brush you were using and you're overusing this, the width of the brush is dictating you, uh, you know, you have this one inch band that you're, you're playing with your brush all through the painting and it's boring to that extent because nature is not that way at all. You know, that you're using a one inch from Bakker. You're on to me. Yeah. No, I can just see it. I mean, it's obvious in your, in your work and it's stiff. I mean, that band across the, the, the center, which is so yes. obvious, sets up everything else in the work. And then you repeat it, you repeat it. You mean be, because I repeat it because of the, well, the, the thickness of, of these, the, the width, width of, of these? And also the, you know, dark and so it's, it's just I see what you're yeah, saying just, yeah if you get in there and loosen that up a little I bit do. more you, you know the painting is not complete in my mind in any in any uh, direction I just love the way you did that window the window the suggestion yeah. of the window it's not overworked it's painterly you know there's some really nice quality to that I think if you maintain that there's you have a really hard edge quality to the leaves coming off that right hand side um, and some of that I like, but I think you need to balance that in other places more. Maybe as Tom suggested in the shadows. Don't change anything because we said so. Right. It's always wise to weigh well, the comments and the criticism. If you feel it's justified, then you make a change. And if you don't, you know, if you like it the way it is, leave it. Yeah, I have to live with it a little bit yeah. and look at it. Our next exhibitor is Kathy Wilner. Uh, what do you have to show us, Kathy? Uh, this is a watercolor painting that I did of uh, a friend and fellow artist, a uh, very good artist by the name of Lori Hess. Uh, we went out into uh, the edge of the woods in the National Park, and I dragged this cast iron chair with me so she could sit down and put a basket at her feet. And what I was going for was uh, to capture a mood, an emotion. Uh, I like uh, to get into the sensitivity of a painting and uh, to get into a sort of an intimate nature of it. And uh, to me, that's what I enjoy to paint. There's a nice pensiveness about the way the figure is sitting there, especially the head down. Can't see the face, but it doesn't matter, you know. Um, I, I like the way you painted the, the drape on her dress. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's well done. Mm -hmm. And I, I like the way the background has been painted, except that I would probably like to see the same kind of light that is in the dress uh, seen in the foreground or maybe some other places. I don't know whether you want whites or anything, but, but something lighter coming through. The other question I had uh, was, do we need 
all the background. In other words, you have the figure silhouetted, uh, sort of a bullseye on a dark background. And I'm wondering, since the figure is that important, do we really need so much of the space around it? I, I, I kind of like the composition with the with that large background like that. I love looking at the at that darks. You know, there's. You go up and you look at the details in there and you see other branches and trees and other subtleties. It, it makes you look at the background. And I, I like paintings like that where you have areas that are sort of, uh, they're subtle and they're hard to see what's going on, but it makes you want to investigate a little bit. And I get that with, uh, with this picture. Uh, the sureness of the drawing of the figure, I, I think very natural, the nice curvature of the spine, the cross legs. I think all that is, is very nicely done. I like the sense of space in that. I like the way you repeated the basket shape and the hat shape. You know, I like that repetition. And, and even in the, the way her figure is, there's a sort of a three, you know, a, a sort of a triangle set up there with the, there's, there's a repetition of that shape in her figure as well in the way her legs are. I, I would like to see maybe a little bit more of something going you know, maybe way back a little bit farther on the on the left in that in that large space, that large dark space, and and maybe maybe a little bit more. I think Tom, like Tom said, in, in the foreground that leads us to her, rather than there's sort of a um, there's sort of a real long rectangle that separates us from her. Although I think she is she's just absolutely beautifully exquisitely done. I. I think the, the element of the basket is not symbolically significant. If you were to blank that basket out and bathe, bathe that uh, aura around her in lights of, of just the, the loneliness of being in nature. I love the light that's falling on her in, in contrast and her clarity in contrast with, with all the other things that are around her that are, are you know, ambiguous and, and, you know, mystical. And she's, you know, she's right there. The, the basket, I think, serves as, a, as sort of a, an anchor That's for her. But I wonder if there would be some other element that you could use that wouldn't be so, um, so literal or so... Well, I'm going to tell you something. I, I look at this as far as finding meaning with the basket and how it fits in with the picture. And, you know, I see this girl in this flower dress. And um, I see this basket as sort of the symbol of uh, what we try to do with nature all the time. You know, we take reeds and, we, and we're going to start to entwine them and we're going to make a basket. We sort of try to force it into our own idea of, mm -hmm. of uh, mm -hmm. life. And what do we do with the flower? We pick it. You know, what's the first thing that happens when it starts to die right away? You know, so, so I could see some, you know, concepts going along that line. The drama of your background with the silhouette of the figure is pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. And I, I really, I, I could make meaning out of that basket, and I could make it part of the composition, but I think for the sake of the picture, if it wasn't in there, it would make the picture more powerful. If that basket is gone, there does need to be something else more, a little bit more solid that, that sits her there. Just because it's so, it is so contrasting and so solid at the top and just so, you know, so beautifully, um, the shapes are just so beautiful and the placement, her placement in that space. But visually, that would become a more magnificent piece without that, yeah. and more universal, and would probably relate to so many more spectators. It's good to be ambiguous. Uh, sometimes when you put that, you know, when you put a certain symbol on, it gives it one interpretation, and then what's going to entice them to keep looking at it? Yeah. Like I said, that background, is, I keep looking at it and yes. finding new things to it, and I keep searching at it, and you know, it's just beautiful to look at. This is, um, I was down in uh, South Carolina with painting with friends. And uh, this girl, too, happens to be a painter. And uh, she modeled for this other friend of mine and I. And uh, we were just sitting on the beach, and she would just sort of 
looking off into the trees that were behind the beach. And uh, the water was like over here somewhere. And uh, just the shape of her body, the, the angle in here, uh, I thought was a very, very sensuous look and a uh, very, uh, very strong line. And with the dark uh, trees in the background against this, to me, it was a very striking pose. And I thought it created, uh, here again, another emotional thing. She's looking off. What is she looking at? Or is she just thinking? And what might she be thinking? And uh, so it was just um, a feeling, again, that I wanted to create. I wanted to try and uh, create a feeling that went from my brush to the viewer. And you're using that dart to contour her shape. To contour yeah. the shape and, and also... And, and the contour her shape is the sensual quality of the, of, of, the, of the figure. But you didn't do it in the foreground. So you, you flatten out everything in the foreground so her legs are, are, are just not even shaped yet because it doesn't have the contour. Her arm, which is leading you into the background of the composition falls totally flat because there isn't enough value, uh, enough contrast uh, in the sand or whatever that you know surface is in the, in, in the uh, lower you know this tr attempting to contour the frontal part of the figure, which would give you foreshortening in the composition. I think you know, like from about halfway up, I think that. You know, the landscape in the background is absolutely beautiful and it just goes way back in your sky and all of that is just the way you've done the trees. It's beautiful back there. I agree with Al that, that we're missing a lot of, you know, I look at those legs and they're beautifully done, but there isn't anything that leads me to them from here, from the bottom of the frame to that in terms of, you know, contours of the sand <clears throat> or shadows or... Um, you know, maybe a maybe a shadow that would be cast from from the from the viewer onto the sand, or from something else outside of the the plane onto the sand that would lead us to that, and maybe even over her a little bit, over over one of her legs, or or something like that. Because those legs are really nicely done, but I but I do miss them. I lose them because of the the sameness of the value of that lower maybe fourth of the painting. I like the vegetation on the right. It is freshly painted, you know, mm -hmm. and gives contrast and so forth. I wish, and I agree with that, that some of that had been in the foreground. The foreground sort of washed out, and the lower part of the legs look like they're floating. And I think more strength and more vibrant painting in that foreground would have helped you mm -hmm. a lot. The dilemma is uh, that time of day where the sun's that bright and it's hitting the sand, and you don't have a lot of definition to it. You know, how do you still capture that character, you know, the character that you want with it? And, um, you know, it, well, you said you're taking some liberties with inventing the background. Right. And like I, the background is beautiful, and I love the figure. And uh, you, your figure drawing is, is quite, uh, on all your pieces, you have a nice uh, uh, feel for it. But, it, you know, the, the cloth, the way you've done her, her clothing, the <clears throat> shadows in there, just really nice, really, really subtle and really nice. I, I really like the genre of not seeing the faces. You know, I think yes. it puts well, a lot much more. Yes, it, yes. Uh, it actually appeals to more people. They think it reminds them of their daughter or their, their yeah. sister or their whoever. If once there's a face in there, then it's the mystery. It's too is specific. Gone. It, it yeah. is. Mm -hmm. Her shoulder and the hat and hair really lovely, really nicely done. It's an honor for me to introduce our next painter, uh, Al Bright. Al, take it away. This piece was created right here in Hudson, Ohio, in an Army, Army Navy place or something, with uh, uh, Phil Cartwright. And he invited me to. Uh, uh, to come and do a painting performance one Sunday afternoon in the American Legion Hall or something here in Hudson. And uh, I came a la prima 
never heard his group before, 35 to 40 minutes, this piece went from a blank canvas to this finished piece with all of the energy and color of the music. I don't know how you do it, but you make the perfect stroke. I never make a perfect stroke. I don't know why, but I never make the perfect stroke and let it stand there and glow as yours do. And using the correct color side by side and bringing out an impasto uh, stroke against a smooth background. You know, all the elements are there. Um, I don't know, it's, it's just a rich painting to me. Um, well thought out. The, the only thing I want to ask you and it is this, and I don't know whether I'm cogitating here about whether I like it or not, is in all these fresh strokes, all of a sudden you put a spear. Well, I know as, as I look back over 40 or 50 years of spontaneous movements, it keeps emerging. And it comes out of some uh, 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 extension of my body into the work. It's my mother's womb. Uh, everything is made up of molecules. It's, it's probably the most significant shape that, uh, that tells us everything about everything. It's beautiful to me. To me, before I heard any of your, you know, I knew that you painted to jazz. And it kind of, to me, represents that jazz does come from that formal structure. And it, it comes from that, and that's the womb, if you will, for where all of that other stuff comes from. So to me, when I looked at that, you know, that, that sphere represented for me that that underlying structure of everything. There's a simplicity to it, but yet there's, there's still an intricacy that uh, uh, is apparent, because you're going from different brush strokes, and, and, and I tell you, the urge to touch your paintings is pretty immense. You know, you just see the thickness of it, and you want to walk up to it, and uh, you want to look at it in different lights, so you can see the shadows cast from it, too. But I love the softness of the top and that gray on the bottom. I just, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. perfect color. Yeah. You know, I don't know how that came to you, but for everything else going on, that, that just the perfect color to offset the other colors. And, you know, to think that this stuff is happening intuitively is pretty impressive. The areas that are so thin, you can almost see the canvas, and then, and then it's like an inch, an inch and a half thick in other places. You go everywhere. You go everywhere with the medium. I mean, it just, it just, it goes from everything it could possibly be. Only thing that I'm not sure about, it's this last stroke here. Okay. <laughs> and that throws me because it, it almost, kids learn, you know, to do birds really quickly. And that stroke comes off like that a little bit, and I don't want to read it that way. But it is that. It is a bird. Oh. Mm -hmm. It is <laughs> okay, a bird, well, and it's been emerging in my work always, oh. always. And not only is it a bird, it's, it gives perspective to all of the other shapes. It puts it in the context as to how big these shapes are in relationship and how spatial everything around that object which you see is and I, I mean it's just been coming it, you know it's, 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 a, it's a metaphor in the work. You can only just redo and, and you know go on top of oils so long before it does turn muddy so you know that's so fresh for that kind of um, for that kind of painting for that way of painting. Uh, appreciating what you do is, is much more than just looking at your work. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, you know, I want to see you do a performance piece too. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. just listening to you talk about your work and the passion you have for what you're doing uh, brings uh, appreciation towards the work when you see the freshness of it mm -hmm. and see how spontaneous it is. Most of us are attuned to looking at a a picture of something, you know, and then looking at it, as breaking it down aesthetically and compositionally and, and all that, and then we go, you know, start to go beyond that, but there's still that, that visual representation, and when you just, you know, are suddenly out of that, it, it's in a whole new, whole new realm.
I did uh, an executive's home in uh, Windermere, Florida, uh, site-specific uh, works uh, for his entire home while he was building it. And the Disney uh, carpenters uh, came as I finished these pieces and they did framings for them and I set them all in, into site-specific places in you know, his whole home. And I haven't seen these things since 87 and I just called them back uh, for the exhibition. But there were uh, 18 of these pieces ranging, these are the smaller pieces, but there were really long, narrow landscapes that were 8, 10 feet long by 30, 40 inches high, but all site specific. This is poetry to me. It is. Uh, it's just so soft and gentle. It is the quietness of, you know, meditation and it, it just is soothing. Uh, well, I'll let somebody else say something. I can breathe it. I can breathe it. The dampness of it, and I can, I mean, I can, it has an atmosphere that I feel like I'm in. It's, it is really, it's beautiful. Um, zen, completely zen. It, the, the fusion of the colors, you know, just the edges and the blurriness, and still the big variety of those. And I, I think that one dark shape up at the top that goes into that little white wisp. That is just beautiful. I mean, yeah. Just look at it that is. all day long. Just the way you handled the paint, you know, it just had it all blend in so beautifully. It's ethereal. It's like a dream. It's like a. It is. Uh, it's like that um, that moment when you find yourself out of yourself, but you immediately come back as soon as you're aware of it. That it's that moment. The topic that comes up in our critiques quite a bit is framing. And I like the way you framed that. Mm -hmm. I like the empty black spot in there. I think that to, to the gray frame, but really nice. It's a shadow box uh, mm -hmm. that causes the painting to literally float. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And now uh, you have a mandorla around it that uh, you know, just like intensifies the color, but just has it levitating in the frame. The framing didn't even come into my mind. <laughs> Everything's just in the right, it's just in the right place. It's just perfect. It is. It is. It's a perfect Thank you, Al. Uh, I represent the last artist on this panel, and I have brought two paintings with me. And I'm going to throw you guys a curve, I think. Uh, this painting was done all oh, something like in 1980. Uh, it preceded a painting that I did in 1970. Um, at the time that I was on campus, the kids were running around arm in arm singing, we shall overcome, you know. And there was a gathering together of blacks and whites, you know. And Martin Luther King was saying, you know, we'll judge people by their character, not by the color of their skin. And it was a whole new era. And uh, at that time, I painted the predecessor to this picture, uh, which was a black figure and a white woman, and they were both embraced in a kiss with a brilliant red background. And I thought it represented, you know, that we finally come together. Ten years later, in the 80s, blacks and whites were getting to pull apart. They didn't want, and there was a tension. And uh, so in this particular picture, which is integration two, um, I've tried to show the tension then between the uh, uh, two races here. Whether it comes across, I don't know. I'll have to ask you. Your, your paintings uh, seem to depict you. This is like a portrait of you. I see the energy that you put into your painting. I see the energy when you speak about your painting. Everything is compacted into, into these works. They're very loose. And line, line is the substance that sparks the color. It gives shape and breadth to the color. Mm -hmm. It suggests forms that are not necessarily closed because you're not seeking closure. It is 
is a su suggestion of closure. Where energy, and the energy project, and it comes through in your painting, mm -hmm. the energy projects through the bodies, mm -hmm. out of the bodies, into the backgrounds, into each other. You know, these figures are fusing together. And, you know, I, I think, um, you know, they, they talk about, uh, you, know, you talk to talk, but you also walk to walk, you know, so I, you know, this is you. I love the way everything that's in that figure is also in that figure. So symbolically, you know, I like to look at things that way too. It's like, you know, it's a struggle between the two races, but everything that's in one is also in the other. Your reputation precedes you, but I've never seen your work like this. And what there is about your work is a sense of urgency. The energy that you can put into that is unbelievable your handling of dark and light to make volumetric shapes out of out of lying encapsulating incredible color is just unreal it's like you it's it's there you got to get it get yeah. it get it out do it do it do it with gusto don't just half do it do it you know as a teacher and as a friend and as a you know a, a fellow critiquer, I've you know, I've seen that and known that all along and it's it's really inspiring. Very inspiring. Oh, man. Not that I could ever or, or would want to paint like that because that's not me. That's but right. but I, I I love that. That's that's so you. I mean that's honest as honest as can be. Now this piece is uh, titled uh, Opus 78, and it is a piece of music that I wrote. Um, you may not read it as that, but I don't sing too well. My wife, who sang in a band in the 50s, um, tells me I can't sing. <laughs> and I love to sing. <laughs> and, uh, but I, so what I do is I create my own music. I don't know whether this comes across to you as music. Like the energies in my first figurative thing, uh, the energies are still there. I mean, the attack on the canvas is still there. And uh, whether it comes across as music, though, to you, I don't know. You have to tell me that. Absolutely, that sound. Oh, look at the rhythm. The, the reverberations of the echoes, the overlapping of sound. Miles Davis uh, played uh, with uh, great, great musicians like Charlie Parker and uh, John Coltrane and Thelonious Monk. And he criticized all three of those people, although they were the greatest in what they were doing. He criticized them because he said that they, didn't know, they did not know how to take critical pauses. Hmm and that his music was based on critical pauses to leave breath and air around reverberations that were still moving time and space. And this is what this thing is doing. That whole piece is just undulating and tingling with molecules of beautiful rhythmic patterns. This is not an attack. This is a, um, this is more of a touch, but not you're going to see that as you're going to hear that as a weakness, whereas, but I don't mean it in that way. You know, Tom, I, I again I look at your paintings and there's a mastery to it. You know, it's uh, you know, is there spontaneity? I mean, I'm always amazed when you talk about your process and you know how you go about it in the meditation and what you put into it. But yet, you know, there's rhythm, balance, proportion. Mm -hmm. Spatial organization, mm -hmm. compass, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. All the you know, you're a master mm -hmm. at what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're a master at what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, though, isn't it like driving a car? You just drive it. You don't think about driving it. Uh, you play golf, you just, if you can just play and not think about it, you have a better game. And the same thing is true of painting, you know. You just, you don't think I'm going to mix yellow and blue and get green. You just do it, you know, or whatever color you want. And it just happens. Because, because you do of, it every day. Because you're doing it every day. And the more you work at your work, 
the, the, I think the stronger you're going to get as a painter or an artist. But that bring that brings up a good point. That do you you don't I I don't. I don't think you can come to something like that by trying to come to some by trying to create something that somebody you just do it and it evolves and the, and the the creativity part and the inspiration part happens as a result of not not that's not the goal. I mean, if, if you you know if if being inspired or being creative is the goal, I don't think you can reach that. But I think it happens because you work every day, because you're. You know, you you just keep after it and keep after it and keep after it. Like Chuck Close says, inspiration is for amateurs. I just get to work. I just get to work. And so by getting to work is where that other thing comes from. It doesn't work the other way around. There's no such thing as talent. It's all hard work. Well, it is mostly. I mean, yeah. I think it mostly is. Yeah. It's not that you're doing something that you don't know how to do. You know how to do it really, really well. But it's so much, it's mature on it. And he is prolific. This is the thing, he's, le he's leaving so much for the world to enjoy beyond his time. And it's enormous as to what he has done through his students, his colleagues, and his uh, fellow artists who have lived in his light and energy. I mean, it's enormous. And I just pray to God that you live a long and healthy life and that you continue to work through your experiences and this love that you have uh, for, for the passion in your work. Thank you very much for joining us here for our little critique session. Thanks to Albright, thanks to Kathy Wellner. Thanks to Carol. Thanks to John Smoko, my best friend. And uh, that ends it for tonight, and we hope you get something out of it and have enjoyed it.